Okay, so let's start a new uh, a topic: stretching of circular sheets. And uh, uh, in this particular uh, topic, uh, we are going to develop some models um, for evaluating some, you know, output properties. Say, for example, pressure or force like that during stretching operations. And uh, we have uh, seen in the previous couple of classes about uh, deep drawing and bending. Similarly, we are going to develop uh, some models here also and this is going to be a small section okay. and um, some theories which you already seen will be adopted here to develop such models and um, whenever we speak about uh, stretching of uh, circular sheets, we can uh, do that actually practically speaking we can do that in two ways. Okay. One is by using punch contacting the sheet. Okay. So, punch along with other tools in bracket I will write uh, tools in general. Okay. So, what you do here is uh, there will be a sheet which will be grabbed on the die and there will be a blank holder and the punch will come and deform the sheet okay. and uh, here the interface friction between the punch and the sheet uh, is going to play a uh, vital role in uh, stress distribution or strain distribution, fracture location. Okay, mm, the depth of fracture, the you know forming depth, all these things will play a uh, your friction is going to play a big role in this. And uh, though this is the case, of course, when you use punch, you can also change the friction, right? So depending on the lubricant you use, friction uh, you know coefficient of friction that is uh, prevailing at the interface, one can control such you know deformation quantities. Another way is basically with fluid pressure. Okay. So, that means what? That means uh, there is no rigid punch. Instead, we are going to deform the sheet with the help of fluid pressure. Okay. So, uh, the tools could be slightly different. So, you can have a, maybe a die or an open die or a shaped die and uh, there will be a chamber through which you are pressurizing the fluid and then that fluid is going to deform the sheet to take up the particular shape or a, a free shape. Okay, so, this is what the main difference here. Of course, when you use fluid pressure, you can understand that there is no friction between the sheet and the, uh, and the, and the, the fluid. Okay. So, which is the main difference with respect to the, uh, you know, when you use a conventional deformation of sheet with the help of punch, okay, uh, specifically in stretching. This uh, using punch uh, deforming the sheet, we have already seen several examples. Uh, though we have seen that in bending and uh, you know deep drawing and uh, in the initial part of the modules okay we have seen uh, stamping operations where punch has been used to deform the sheet so we have seen that predominantly and all those theories are valid here also except that uh, we have not seen anything about uh, uh, this uh, fluid pressure based deformation which will which will be the first part in this particular module okay so the first heading is uh, bulging with the fluid pressure Okay, bulging with fluid pressure and uh, this can also be called as hydrostatic bulge test. In short, they call it as HBT. Like uniaxial tension test we have like UAT we say similarly, we can say hydrostatic bulge test. Okay, this is nothing but bulging of a sheet with the help of a fluid pressure. Okay, so, you know this uh, bulging with fluid pressure, if you use it as an experimental uh, method to characterize the sheet properties, then this becomes hydrostatic bulge test. Otherwise, Bulging with fluid pressure is a method to deform a sheet and you can make any, uh, any component shape with that. Okay. Otherwise, we can also characterize it, characterize the sheet with the help of hydrostatic bulge test. Like your uniaxial tensile test we have, similarly we can use a hydrostatic bulge test. So, a schematic is described here. So, you can see that uh, at the bottom there is a, let us say there is a die and uh, there is a retainer or a blank holder here you can say. And uh, initially the sheet is, let us say, flat. Okay, the initially the sheet is uh, flat like this, and then in between, uh, you give a fluid pressure, let us say P. Uh, that is the pressure with which your uh, sheet is going to uh, deform. That is the amount of pressure that you give. And let us say rho is the radius of curvature we have. And let us say at one particular stage, your deformation height, your forming height is about H. Okay. So, you can imagine like there is a pressure versus height, you know, curve. Okay. You can draw a graph between pressure versus height. So, with increase in pressure, what happens to height? That again, that kind of characterization one can do. And you can say that uh, A is basically uh, this particular uh, down dimension from the axis uh, to the clamping location here. 
okay and r is basically any radius uh, from the axis r is basically any radius from the axis okay so i have written here that uh, hbt is a common experiment used to characterize the material or a sheet a stress strain response at uh, higher strain levels okay so like in new axle tension test we characterize the materials stress strain behavior but uh, in that case basically you may uh, get the uh, sheets characteristics only up to a particular limited strain value let us say here you can get uh, to a larger extent okay so you can deform a material uh, the same sheet let us say aluminum or steel if you do it with the hbt you can get a stress strain response to a larger extent to larger strains that is the main uh, advantage if you speak it in terms of characterization i think we have seen this briefly in the formability test okay in one particular chapter we have seen this anyway so let's come back to this you can see that it is made up of a metal sheet here okay this is your sheet it is partially formed sheet that is inserted in a die with a circular uh, aperture so die has got a circular aperture here uh, that is at the center you can see there is a hole and uh, through which the material is going to deform okay and it is uh, secured and uh, deformed using an internal pressure okay that is i was pressure p okay so and uh, of course our main uh, focus is basically this a region okay on both the sides you can say a region and uh, let us say a sheet thickness is t okay so uh, you can pick up this a region only and we can uh, show this kind of diagram about uh, your state of uh, stress we know that already you know like sigma theta is basically your uh, uh, one of the uh, principal stress and sigma phi is going to be another principal stress okay so uh, sigma phi sigma theta theta are already known to us okay so your uh, sigma theta is on the circumferential direction and sigma phi we said that in uh, in the deep drawing the sigma phi was represented as a cup wall stress stress in the cup wall sigma phi we represented a similar one you can see the direction it is in this particular direction as compared to sigma theta and sigma 3 is always there perpendicular sheet thickness otherwise sigma t that also can be seen so these are the Uh, stresses acting on at any uh, element in this particular deformation zone that is a a zone on both the sides okay so uh, the sheet is bulged to a spherical shape by a fluid pressure so you can imagine that uh, this particular shape is approximately spherical shape you can imagine like that and uh, if you look into the state of stress and strain okay so we are going to concentrate mainly in this pole region this topmost point in this deformation zone no this is called a pole okay this is called pole region okay so if you look into the state of stress and strain in this pole region that means uh, you are going to take an element from this and you are going to see what is the state of stress and strain of course you will have sigma uh, the same thing will happen sigma phi will be there and sigma theta will be there okay corresponding strains also will come into picture and uh, at this location if you see you are going to have sigma phi and then sigma theta which is related to sigma phi by alpha into sigma phi okay and uh, you have sigma t which is nothing but our sigma 3 uh, which is going to be zero because of plain stress assumption that we are doing right from the beginning so you can get the nomenclature you know what do you mean by sigma phi sigma phi is like sigma 1 sigma theta is like sigma 2 sigma t is like sigma 3 which you are regularly following until now there's a slight change here other than this everything is same so now if you look into the pole okay this pole region it is uh, characterized by alpha is equal to 1 what i'm saying is in the pole region if you pick up an element here and see what is the relation between sigma phi and sigma theta they both are equal sigma phi is equal to sigma theta so basically we say alpha is equal to 1 we say alpha is equal to 1 we say so when you say alpha is equal to 1 i am going to write sigma theta is equal to sigma phi directly i am going to write so that is one important thing so you now if you know if alpha is equal to 1 what is beta that can be calculated again by using levy mesas flow rule it is equal to 1 okay so and uh, i am going to write epsilon phi is going to be there and epsilon theta would be equal to beta of epsilon phi which is going to be epsilon phi only and epsilon t can be written either as ln of t by t not right t by new thickness divided by original thickness at any location okay and uh, if epsilon theta is equal to epsilon phi then you can write epsilon t as minus 2 epsilon phi minus 2 epsilon phi we have already seen this already so you can get epsilon 1 plus 2 plus 3 is equal to 0 
and in that uh, two strains are same. So, epsilon t or epsilon 3, okay, and nothing but epsilon 3, epsilon t would be equal to minus 2 times uh, epsilon 5, okay. So, this is what is main important state of stress and strain in hydrostatic bulging, okay. And uh, just to extend this uh, point, we have uh, you know the procedure of uh, evaluating sigma bar and epsilon bar also for any situation. We have seen that several times. In this case also we can get sigma bar and epsilon bar. So, we can use von Mises effective stress equation which we have derived before. I just uh, written here for your convenience. So, square root of 1 minus alpha plus alpha square into sigma 1 is equal to sigma f which is also equal to sigma bar only. So, what will you get as sigma bar is if you put alpha is equal to 1 here it is going to be equal to sigma 1 which is nothing but my sigma phi. Okay, you can directly write here and uh, if you put beta is equal to 1, 3, 3 will be cancelled. So, uh, you will get uh, 2 epsilon 1, okay. So, which is nothing but epsilon bar is equal to 2 epsilon phi, 2 times epsilon phi is nothing but minus epsilon t. So, you can write minus epsilon t, right. 2 times epsilon phi here is minus epsilon t, okay. So, you can get minus epsilon t here. So, in hydrostatic bulge dust or when you uh, stretch a sheet uh, with a uniform fluid pressure P, okay, then we can write sigma bar is nothing but sigma phi only and epsilon bar is equal to 2 times epsilon phi which is nothing but minus epsilon t, right. So, of course, one can uh, you know see uh, what is the uh, comparison with respect to uniaxial tension test, okay. In uniaxial tension test one can get what is alpha. So, alpha is, uh, is sigma 2 by 1. So, alpha is going to be equal to 0 in UAT, uh, in UAT it is going to be equal to 0. Then what is beta we can find out. And we can also get such relationship for new axial tension test just for comparison, right. So, that is uh, one thing. So, this is one, one important result we have here. So, now our main aim in this particular uh, module is to get this P. What is the, can we derive an equation for P? Can we derive an equation for, simple equation again, okay. Uh, there is no complexity, there is simple equation for P, okay. So, for that, what I am going to do is, I am going to use uh, an equation which we already know, we have not derived in this particular course, we have not derived, but I think we have already known that, known that you are this, this kind of, you know, stretching of uh, or deformation of uh, circular shells or circular sheets. We can relate sigma phi equal to sigma theta because alpha is equal to 1 which will be equal to p rho by 2 t, okay. I think we have already uh, studied this probably in solid mechanics, one can look into it. So, sigma phi is equal to sigma theta is equal to because alpha is equal to 1 will be equal to p rho by 2t and all our usual definitions p is your pressure and rho is, is indicated in the diagram and t is your sheet thickness. So, this is one result we will come back to this okay there will be some small equation we are going to substitute here but before that we can also uh, see how strain distribution is uh, happening okay how strain distribution is happening uh, when you see the deformed sheet from the pole to a region along radius, okay. Pole means this is the pole to A region means in the gripping region, okay. So, from pole to this A from the gripping region, this from A distance, okay, in the radial direction. So, along radius we are going to see how strain distribution is going to vary. So, naturally we have only two surface strains, in plane strains. One is uh, you have epsilon phi and epsilon theta. From these two we can get epsilon t, okay. So, we are not going to include that here. So, you will see that uh, from pole which is at the center here to A which is a gripping region, we have seen that uh, you have uh, of course, uh, same epsilon phi and epsilon theta at the pole region. Why? Because it is beta is equal to 1, okay. The membrane strains or membrane strains or you can say uh, the surface strains are equal at the pole, okay, where r is equal to 0, okay, where your r is equal to 0 if you put here. So, both the strains will be same. Why? Because beta is equal to 1. Now, at the edge of the sheet, uh, edge of the sheet, that means when you are coming here at the edge of the sheet, this is your edge, it is clamped, no, it is clamped. So, the circumferential strain at the edge is 0, the circumferential strain at the edge is 0. So, you will see that uh, your epsilon theta will go to 0, but epsilon phi will have some value, epsilon phi will have uh, some value, okay. So, epsilon theta, so the one corresponding to this will be 0 at the edge and this fellow will have uh, some value which is what is given in this particular graph, okay. And uh, you will see that uh, from the top two 
uh, from the from the pole region to A, both the strains are going to decrease. Both the strains are going to decrease. Okay, which means uh, when you do a fluid pressure based deformation of sheet or uh, uh, which is equivalent to saying a frictionless case, totally frictionless case, then there are chances that your uh, surface strains, in plane strains are going to be maximum at the pole region and it is going to diminish when you move towards, uh, when you move away from the pole. Okay. So, this region is of focus to us, that is why we always bother about pole. Okay. So, your strain is going to be maximum at the pole region if it is a frictionless case. For example, if it is a hydrostatic bulge test, then you can expect peak strain at the pole region and it is going to diminish in this way. So, epsilon theta will be 0, epsilon phi will have some value. So, what is the importance of this particular test? So, the primary justification for employing this test lies in its ability to induce substantial strain in materials with minimal strain hardening even before reaching failure. Okay. So, it means that suppose if you take a material with uh, probably uh, you know uh, it has got minimal strain hardening, suppose ductility itself is not that good. So, getting its characteristics, uh, stress strain characteristics using any axial tense could be very restricted. Okay. In such type of materials also you can use uh, this uh, hydrostatic bulge test okay, and you get sufficient you know stress strain data uh, before failure happens. And uh, this particular FLD, FLD we are aware of that, okay, it is between uh, you know, epsilon 1 versus epsilon 2, in this case basically epsilon phi and epsilon theta I have drawn and this is your typical forming limit curve, we know that, right? this is your typical forming limit curve of that any material you can imagine. Okay. So, your uh, of course, we know that uh, in this uh, you know hydrostatic bulge test where the strains are equal, beta is going to be 1, then uh, your strain path is going to be orange color 1 the bulge test will follow this particular strain path or mode of deformation and it will reach forming limit curve at this particular location. Okay? And there you are mentioning these two limit strains as epsilon theta star and epsilon phi star, like epsilon 1 star and 2 star, no? we are aware of this nomenclature, what is it from our instability chapter. Okay? So, uh, you will see that it is going to reach your forming limit curve along this. Now, on the other hand, when you speak about uniaxial tension test, which is on the leftmost uh, you know, on, on the second quadrant on the left side, you will see that uh, the material is going to follow this particular black strain path and is going to reach your forming limit curve here. Okay. But we also know that tensile instability occurs at let us say epsilon u is equal to n, okay, which is going to be somewhere here, necking in the tensile test may start here itself. Okay, and you will see that this value is going to be larger than this value, okay. uh, you know your bulge test value is going to be slightly larger than this fellow. So, in a way you can say that okay, the uh, membrane strains, membrane strains at the point of failure under biaxial stress that is in bulge test denoted as epsilon phi star and epsilon theta star in the FLC figure surpasses the strain observed at necking in the traditional tension test. Okay. In this way, one can understand that when you do hydrostatic bulge test, there is a little advantage even for low ductile material that you can have a stress strain behavior comfortably which is not possible in your conventional uniaxial tension test. And this I already mentioned, okay. so it becomes apparent that effective strain equals twice the membrane strain experienced during biaxial tension which is not the case in uniaxial tension test, in uniaxial tension test you can find out what is the value, we already done that before. Okay. So, because of this small advantage uh, other than uniaxial tension test, if you want to have good fit for your stress strain curve okay, beyond your tensile fracture, okay, then one can go for this kind of hydrostatic bulge test. Fine. So, now let us try to get uh, an equation for pressure, a simple equation for pressure, okay, which is not again uh, very accurate. Uh, it is going to be an approximate model, but it will give you a quick feel for what would be the pressure and how to calculate it. So, uh, here again we are going to consider bulging of a circular uh, I have turned diaphragm, it is like a sheet only, thin sheet you can imagine. Okay, and uh, we are going to develop an approximate model for that. So, with respect to the previous figure, uh, this particular figure you can imagine, this particular figure, okay, we can write this uh, area of deformed surface is 2 pi rho h. So, rho is the uh, your bend uh, radius and h is the, the deformed height. If you multiply that 2 pi times, then you will get area of the deformed surface, that is 1. 
So you want to equate volumes before and after deformation, we can do that. So initial one is uh, up to clamping region, so naturally pi a square t naught, initial thickness is t naught, new thickness could be t, okay. So you can say 2 pi rho h into t, if you get it, so you will get t as uh, t is equal to t naught a square by 2 rho h, okay. So a is a constant, we know this, a is also fixed, rho may change with respect to a and h. Okay, and your h will anyway change, your height is uh, forming height will anyway change. So now again as usual we are going to consider sigma bar is equal to k epsilon power n let us say and uh, we can write in a simple equation sigma bar is equal to the sigma bar is nothing but sigma phi which we already derived right, sigma bar is equal to sigma phi no, sigma bar is equal to sigma phi we already derived. So, so sigma bar is nothing but sigma phi equal to k epsilon bar is this fellow is nothing but what is the value epsilon bar? Epsilon bar is nothing but minus epsilon t, right? Minus epsilon t, epsilon bar is nothing but minus epsilon t. So, which is nothing but ln of t naught by t, which is nothing but ln of t naught by t. It is generally t by t naught but minus. So, you because you have minus, I am writing ln of t naught by t power n. This will be useful for us. We are going to simply put this equation sigma phi into the previous equation for pressure. Okay, so now pressure to bulge diaphragm is given by, we are going back to this equation. So, P here is nothing but my 2 sigma phi T divided by rho, right. P rho by 2 T is sigma phi, right. So, P is equal to 2 sigma phi T by rho, right, 2 sigma phi T by rho. And what I am going to do is very simple. So, in place of T, which is a new thickness, I am going to put my previous equation t is nothing but t naught a square by 2 rho h, t naught uh, a square by 2 rho h I will put and uh, finally I will get this equation and uh, instead of that I can write sigma bar a square t naught divided by h rho square. So finally I will get uh, this equation for pressure, t is equal to t naught a square by 2 rho h. So t naught a square will remain. Uh, here and fine. So, and you will get this particular equation and uh, the only uh, important points that you should, uh, you know, like uh, some couple of important points that you should note here is like in the previous uh, equations which we derived in the previous chapter, your sigma phi, uh, either you can take a, a constant flow stress or you can make it as a function of strain. Uh, so, in a way you can consider strain hardening. If not, you can have an average uh, flow stress also like what we have seen in deep drawing and uh, the only concern is uh, this rho. So this rho of course can be if you can relate it to A and H then it becomes uh, all known values, all known values. So that one can get it otherwise uh, from this you can get a graph between P and H, one can get a typical characteristics of uh, P and H, right. Okay. So now. Uh, as I said, when the sheet is bulging, the pressure may peak at dp is equal to 0, this is what I was telling you. So if you get a p versus h, there will be one peak, let us say, for example, something like this, I am just randomly drawing. So at this location, you will see dp is equal to 0, we can put, after which bulging will continue with the decreasing pressure gradient, with the decreasing pressure gradient because it indicates uh, something is happening in the material, it could be instability, okay, just due to pressure just due to pressure without any friction. So which means that when the strain at the pole approaches forming limit as shown in forming limit curve earlier, rupture will happen. So we have fixed that fracture is going to happen at the pole region and uh, fracture is going to initiate there and uh, if you put an instability condition like dp is equal to 0, okay. So you can compare these two cases like uh, when is your strain going to reach your uh, forming limit curve like we have shown here this particular point uh, and when dp is going to become 0. These two can be compared to quantify your instability but uh, it may so happen that uh, your uh, limit strain may reach FLC little after dp becoming 0, little after dp becoming 0, okay. But if you consider this uh, diaphragm or sheet as a load carrying member then you have to be very careful that maximum pressure point constitutes instability and fracture. Okay, where maximum pressure point, no, this particular point is actually uh, should be the deciding uh, a criterion for 
uh, your uh, if it is a load carrying structure or if you are deforming it one should see the difference between dp is equal to 0 and when epsilon 1 star and 2 star is getting reached. So, one has to be careful in these two. Otherwise, uh, for hydrostatic bulge test, a simple equation for P is obtained by sigma bar, which can be related to uh, your epsilon as a function of epsilon, you can say A square T naught by H rho square. So, now with this simple analysis, let us go to stretching over hemispherical punch. Okay? Now, fluid pressure based deformation is done, let us say, same material is actually stretched over a hemispherical punch, like what we have seen in uh, uh, limiting. Uh, dome height test, which you have discussed in the, in the formability chapter. So, similar uh, situation is uh, shown here. Uh, you can see that the sheet is, uh, you know, uh, held in this particular location. Okay. So, and there is a hemispherical, uh, you know, punch. Uh, the punch has got a hemispherical uh, end at the this particular location. You can see, and uh, all the values are given here. Okay. So, you will see that. Uh, uh, the uh, sheet is actually getting deformed and uh, one thing which you should know here when you deform it using a punch is interface friction. What is this fellow going to do? Okay. What is this fellow going to do in this uh, interface? That is very important uh, for us to know. And uh, you pick up an element as usual like the way we say, we discuss generally, you pick up an element here in the deforming zone anywhere, maybe here or here, anywhere here, but little away from the gripping and the pole region and you plot the, you know, tension here. Okay. So, your normal pressure P is going to act on the sheet element and uh, your uh, T phi is going to act in this way and T phi plus D phi, D T phi is going to act in this way. This is similar to what we have seen in simplified stamping analysis. A similar diagram we, uh, we drew similar one here okay and because of p you have mu p here which is nothing but your uh, you know effect of friction comes into picture okay so uh, there is some change in tension which is on one side it is t phi the other side it is t plus uh, dt phi okay so we know that uh, the sheet tension escalates proportionally with the displacement of punch right because it is gripped in these two regions so naturally when you make a punch to uh, get displaced in this direction the tension will actually escalate it will increase right so now when you pick up a frictionless case when you pick up a frictionless case in scenarios where there is negligible friction between the sheet and the punch the highest strain emerges at the pole as shown in this particular figure okay the same figure which i have used before same figure which i have used before the higher highest strain emerges at the pole as shown in this figure so this is where you have highest strain so because it is going to have a larger strain, we expect a failure also to happen in the pole region through like you know maybe tearing or splitting like that. The material will tear apart in this particular location F. So, it is very simple. So, strain distribution for a frictionless cases already we know that. So, failure is going to get initiated at the pole because that strain is going to be larger as compared to other locations. So, now if you do not put lubricant, this is a frictionless case. no. Frictional excess means you put lot of lubricant. Okay, lubricant, lubricated, let us say. I am writing, well lubricated, let us say. Okay. Frictionless case means well lubricated. Okay. So now there is another case where there is no lubricant, okay, or a dry friction, maybe you can say the case with friction. So now this frictionless case is a little impractical actually. There is going to be friction, whatever lubricant you can put, okay, then there is going to be it is going to be challenging to keep it frictionless, otherwise one has to go for hydrostatic bulge type. So, uh, presence of friction, okay, it may change certain uh, strain patterns in the uh, in the sheet, strain distribution in the sheet, which is what uh, very crucial for us to know what is it. The strain distribution epsilon phi okay, is plotted with respect to R okay, from pole to A, let us say. In this two are compared, one is uh, without friction blue color the other one is with friction red color. Okay. So, uh, that is what I have shown in the second point. Due to the influence of friction contact stress that is mu p, just now we introduced this mu p component here. Okay. Because of this mu p, it is going to this mu p, this is going to actually pull the point of maximum tension okay, away from the pole region. Okay. So, this mu p what is going to do is because 
okay it is available somewhere in the deforming region okay if you see this because of the presence of mu p okay in the uh, case with friction this is this is going to actually pull the maximum strain from the pole you know towards some other location away from the pole okay so that is the main uh, job of this mu p here the point of maximum tension and strain is located away from the pole region so which means if you draw epsilon phi from pole to a then it will follow this red color pattern so it will be having some value at the pole region and uh, at a particular location let us say your r let us say it will be maximum and then again it will diminish again it will diminish so when compared to without friction case this is very different you will see that so the peak value is going to happen not at the pole but little away from the pole this much distance away from the pole it is going to change okay so whereas this is the pole region that is the main function of uh, this friction so this specific location becomes the anticipated uh, failure point susceptible to splitting so now here in this case you can see f here here in this case you can see f here okay so with friction failure is going to happen a little away from the pole region maybe at r distance uh, when compared to the case without friction where failure is going to happen at the pole so you can also see that uh, maybe this uh, fracture this uh, failure location could be circular in nature okay so you can see you know from the top view you can see from the top view that this r is going this r location is going to be there at any radius in the circular diaphragm isn't it so it may, it may split uh, you know depending on how instability develops it may split in the entire ring of uh, uh, the circular path okay between the peak and the gripping region somewhere in the at a distance of r it will fail this is the main difference between with friction and without friction case okay so let us come to the effect of punch shape what is this punch going to do so uh, we are taking two extreme cases one is a flat bottomed punch flat bottomed punch means like this okay so there is a vertical uh, you know uh, portion of this uh, punch as usual and there is a small corner here and the bottom is flat okay bottom is flat like this as a small corner bottom is flat okay so uh, in this diagram you will see that there are uh, there is one upper figure and lower figure upper figure is going to tell you about thinning distribution okay with respect to r okay so that means when you move from uh, pole to that means let us say from the topmost point of the sheet let us say for example from here okay to this particular region how thinning is going to change uh, epsilon t thickness strain but we have put minus here so how thinning is going to change is what is shown in the upper figure and lower figure is going to tell you two different stages when you have uh, you know uh, with friction and without friction okay two things are shown here actually so one this is a flat bottomed one okay with friction and without friction okay so uh, and uh, you will see that uh, this thickness strain distribution is not same okay in one case you will see that it's going to peak uh, you know somewhere here in the other case peak is somewhere here okay the peak value on the with friction case is going to be larger as compared to without friction if you go for flat bottom case because your mu is going to play a one big role only in the corner region nothing much will be there in the flat bot flat region so i am saying the friction is limited to radius of the punch corner in the flat bottom punch radius of the punch corner means this this radius this radius no so it is limited to that particular location okay this prevents the material from being stretched over the flat face of the punch as a result of increase in tension there so naturally tension will be more in this particular location and hence your face region may not play a big role in stretching operation and uh, what will happen here is uh, since uh, you know your friction is going to play a role only in the corner region okay in with friction case uh, that means uh, less lubricated with friction case you will see the thinning is going to dominate in this location as compared to the other case so at the same stage okay you will say the thinning is going to dominate so naturally what you can do is so uh, uh, obviously uh, in without friction case you can go for larger draw as uh, larger stretching as compared to with friction case as a result maximum depth or forming height that can be reached is lesser in the case of with friction that's why i just made this difference you can see this difference no this difference comes into picture mainly because uh, uh, in the uh, frictionless case that is on the left hand side on the left hand side 
okay you may have a reached a larger forming height okay maximum depth can be reached is lesser in the case of with friction case okay that main reason is the corner region because there is a lot of friction the corner region thinning will be dominant in this location as compared to the other one so now if you move to the other one pointed punch or hemispherical punch something like that you can imagine then the situation is shown in this diagram a similar diagram thinning is plotted with respect to uh, your radius and uh, you have two locations one is left side okay and then the other one is uh, right side so right side you, you see that friction is available that is with friction left side is without friction in this case it is actually opposite in this case it's going to be opposite okay so if it is uh, with friction okay that means uh, your mu p is going to be there okay then we can imagine that uh, your uh, strain distribution thinning distribution is going to be something like this okay though we know that uh, your peak is going to be away from the pole region and it is going to be lower as compared to the case uh, in the left hand side that is a case with uh, without friction okay so this is going to have better forming height as compared to the other so pointed punch has an opposing effect when there is no friction that means on the left hand side the stress is focused to closer to the nose and depth before failure is constrained okay that we already studied friction has the effect of reducing the tension at the nose and dispersing the strain across a larger area allowing for deeper forming so it will not allow okay your strain to concentrate in a localized region okay like in the pole rather what is going to do is it's going to distribute the strain uniformly when compared to uh, you know without friction case and hence you will see that the peak strain is going to be less as compared to this this value you see it is going to be less so you may have a larger forming height so uh, your friction and shape of punch is going to play a significant role uh, in determining the uh, forming height and uh, strain pattern and localization uh, of strain and uh, fracture and failure okay one has to be careful okay in flat bottom punch how to manage mu okay how to manage lubrication and in uh, a pointed punch like hemispherical punch how to manage mu friction one has to be a little bit uh, be aware of what is the change so before we complete this particular section let us see a small uh, subsection stretching of a sheet with a hole stretching of a sheet with a hole so okay we are not going to derive any equation rather we have seen some of this before and we have just picked up the details and let us try to understand some important parts here so stretching of sheet with a hole means what suppose you have a sheet okay and then you are stretching it that we already seen let us assume that you have a sheet and there is a hole at the mid there is a central hole and that has been grabbed and stretched like this a simple schematic i have drawn here let us say this is your uh, you know let us say this is your punch is red color one no let us say this is your punch okay so let us say this is your sheet and there is a hole at the center let us say like this so uh, a hole radius let us say ri and uh, let us pick up r not as a reference uh, radius for us okay at r not radius there is a tension t phi that is acting on the material t phi that is acting on the sheet so you are stretching it with the help of t phi applied tension okay and hole will actually expand okay so this this what we are studying is applicable for hole expansion test so hole expansion test i think we already discussed in formability uh, chapter uh, basically it's a formability test which will tell you uh, you know the deformability of or formability of the hole of the entire sheet along with the hole so when your hole is going to crack and formability will be stopped will be over is what you can find out from hole expansion test there are standards available but here we are just giving you a schematic so a circular blank with a hole stretched over a doomed punch is shown the hole radius is ri and t phi tension is applied as shown okay so now at the edge of the hole okay when you see this edge this edge is what is going to crack fail it should fail okay uh, with the deformation right so if you see t phi how is it moving how is changing from the this particular location or not to ri okay r r to r i you will see that t phi must be zero okay at the edge because it it's actually a hole itself okay and a state of uniaxial tension in the circumferential direction would exist as per tresca yield locus suppose if you follow tresca yield function 
okay, then uh, your T phi is 0, which means that there is going to be only one stress, which means that it could be uniaxial in the circumferential direction. Okay. And uh, these tensions can be plotted in Tresca in the first quadrant as shown in this particular right side figure. Okay. So, I have drawn a tension locus, tension basically instead of uh, you know stress based yield locus, I am drawn a tension locus. I think we have studied this at the end of your uh, second chapter okay, where T1 and T2 can be used to draw a locus like sigma 1 and sigma 2. So, instead of sigma 1 and sigma 2, I have just drawn here T1 and T2 which is nothing but T theta and T phi. Okay, and I just drawn the first quadrant which is what is interesting to us. Okay, so, that is why I mentioned a part of second quadrant and a part of fourth quadrant here. Huh? So, this is your first quadrant. So, uh, the first quadrant of Fortresca is shown here and you will see that uh, you know when uh, Ri at Ri is here, hmm, Ri location that is at the whole edge is here where T phi is actually 0, where T phi is actually 0. That is what I mentioned as T phi has to be 0 at the edge. Okay. So, this is nothing but your uh, T bar okay. or other words you can say T y yield tension or T bar. Okay. T bar is what we have seen in the previous chapter, the redrawing chapter. So, T bar could be your yield tension okay, when this locus is actually getting satisfied. So, when you move from R i to R naught, so, R naught may not uh, be equal to T bar. So, this height is T bar again here. Uh, this height is nothing but T bar. It may not reach T bar. Okay. It will be here in this location and uh, here you will see that there is going to be some T phi and there is going to be some T theta. So, that will be the situation of uh, your hole and away from the hole with respect to tension. So, now if you want to derive a simple equation for this tension T phi, I want to get this T phi. Okay. We can apply force equilibrium and we can find out, but what I would show here is we will uh, use this differential equation which we have already derived in deep drawing process and we are just going to simply follow that. Okay. So, in the deep drawing we already derived that we can you remember that we consider there is an element in the flange region. Okay, and then we apply you know force equilibrium along the radial direction. So, all these calculations we can get and uh, you can see that d sigma r divided by dr plus sigma t by t dt by r minus sigma theta minus sigma r by r equal to 0. Okay. And uh, we also said that this term will be 0. Why? Because we said t is not going to change. t is equal to t naught in that this fellow will become 0. So, what I am going to do is uh, this part I am removing. Okay, I am going to use this and this, I am going to just rewrite it for this particular hole stretching problem and I am writing in terms of tension I am writing. So, d t phi divided by d r minus d t theta minus t theta minus t phi by r equal to 0. This part is removed, everything else I am just keeping as it is, which I am going to rewrite again as d t phi by d r minus instead of t phi, I am going to write t bar. Okay minus T phi divided by R equal to 0. Everything will remain same. This fellow is going to change. Why? Because this T theta, this T theta can be equal to T bar okay, at R i. So, I am going to write this. So, I am just given a hint here. Tensions in the sheet are T phi and T theta is equal to T bar. Okay, and T theta is equal to T bar. Okay. So, now I am going to put a boundary condition and I am going to integrate it. So, what is the boundary condition? at r is equal to r i, t phi is equal to 0. Right? At r is equal to r i, my t phi would be equal to 0 and if I integrate it, I will get a simple equation t phi is equal to a t bar into 1 minus r i by r. r i by r. What is r i? Is this r is any radius uh, away from the axis. Okay? So, uh, the above equation can be drawn schematically to show tension distribution during hole stretching, which is what I have shown here. Suppose if you plot T versus R, you can see that, uh, so again as I said T phi, T phi would be R i. At R i, if you see it would be 0, that means at the whole edge and it will uh, increase and will reach a point at R naught. Okay? And T theta would remain almost uh, constant at one particular value. Right, so, this is uh, 
one way to analyze it. Now, what is the similarity with respect to circular blank without a hole? Okay, in circular blank without a hole, we know that t phi is equal to t theta, right? Why? Because we already said sigma phi is equal to sigma theta. Why? Because it is alpha is equal to one. Uh, same thing works out here. T phi is equal to T theta. So this can happen from the tension locus figure. We can say that this can happen. This can occur only if these two are equal to T phi. Only if these two are equal to T phi. Otherwise, this cannot happen, right? And it is also obvious because when you say alpha is equal to one, put it in that equation before. Okay, you will see that uh, uh, this fellow uh, will lead to sigma phi equal to sigma theta is equal to sigma bar we said instead of that we are writing t phi equal to t theta is equal to t bar okay so now this differential equation what will happen here this also will go off this will be removed okay you can simply say dt phi by dr equal to 0 dt phi by dr equal to 0 in fact you can also uh, try uh, you know with respect to uh, maybe you can use uh, in this case we said alpha is equal to uh, in, in axial no in this case we said alpha is equal to 0 you can say uh, say for example uh, if we say at the edge okay t phi is equal to 0 uh, then uh, your it may reach uh, the other one t theta would become t bar right so that can be obtained even if you take some alpha value if you assume uniaxial alpha and then you put it in a 1 minus and find out you may get this let us you can try that anyway so uh, uh, now this equation we are getting so only difference here is uh, only the first part of the previous equation comes into picture circular blank without a central hole which is nothing but the previous one a conventional you know stretching so this indicates that t phi does not change with uh, radius and hence the stress distribution is uniform which follows t phi is equal to t theta is equal to t bar right and uh, this is what we also got before sigma phi is equal to sigma theta is equal to sigma bar equal to p rho by 2t so with respect to uh, your uh, stress distribution and tension distribution you can uh, check the similarity between okay or you can make a case uh, you know a sheet with a central hole and sheet without a central hole you can make a case between these two you can compare these two and one can understand these things okay so uh, we stop here we again discuss in the a new thing in the next chapter mm -hmm.